Dan Jurgensen, the funding gap, now no pressure on the development bank to fill that gap, but there's a great debate. What is, quantify for me your understanding of the funding gap, and do you as a development bank need to change some of your lending practices and your credit criteria to help close the funding gap? Well, I think um, you know, there's a lot of talk about this $100 billion number. Yes. Um, and everybody says, well, well you know, show me the money. Uh, and, and I'd say a couple of things about that number at the outset. Um, the first is that we kind of made it up. You know, it's not grounded in any fundamental analysis. Actually, if we look at you know, more, more fundamental work, the IEA says we need a trillion and a half dollars of infrastructure investment in sustainable finance by 2030. So actually, the need is much larger, number one. Number two, uh, when we talk about this amount of money, we're actually not talking about outcomes. There's a lot of risk when you talk about mobilize X amount of money that you actually don't achieve the goal that you need. And the third thing I'd say about this number, uh, which I think, I really do think a fixation on it can be, can be misleading, is that it inherently assumes that what we're going through is a burden sharing exercise. Mm. That um, in fact, there's a cost to be shared. And that was the model of climate transition when we thought most of these technologies were not um, NPV positive. But we now know that actually almost every core net zero technology will ultimately get to the point where it's commercially viable. And so I think there's a real need to change the conversation from one of burden sharing uh, to one of opportunity seizing. And I think that we're going to find in the years ahead that decarbonization is development, that the countries that position themselves along this immense river of capital and skills and technology that is going to flow, these countries are going to attract FDI. They're going to build manufacturing bases. They're going to generate high quality jobs. Um, and happy to come to the ADB's role in a minute. I'm not trying to dodge that question, but. <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> Go on. Uh, let's talk about Rwanda. What do you need? I mean, um, the, the, the theory is uh, a speculative number that was made up. Tell me what you really need uh, to, to make this equality uh, and this transition. Uh. Rwanda has costed its, its, uh, its strategy up to 2030. Mm -hmm. The total needs is about uh, 11 billion US dollars. Distributed across key sectors uh, of mitigation and uh, adaptation to climate change. The biggest part is uh, smart and uh, resilient agriculture. Uh, the other one is uh, sustainable transport mm -hmm. systems. So if we continue to uh, uh, waste management, water and sanitation, uh, and, and so on. So the total from 2020 to 2030 is 11 billion US dollars. OK, so that, that's the reality of money. money. The mayor of uh, Freetown in Sierra Leone, Yvonne, thank you very much, first of all, for making time to be with us on a virtual basis. You're dealing with your own uh, crisis. We wish you well. Uh, with, with the natural disaster that you, that you have in Sierra Leone. So our thoughts are with you on, on that side. So uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear uh, the, you know, Ahmed say, actually, let's get real. They, they, they sort of uh, came up with a, a finger in the air in terms of the $100 billion number. You're the mayor of free time in Sierra Leone. You heard a great deal talked about in a cold and wet Glasgow. What do you need on the ground? to make a just transition. Tell this audience what you really need. Thanks so much, Manis, and good morning, everyone. I think um, moving from the rhetoric to the reality, um, actually having the access to the finance, and yes, I've heard this a number of times, that was a finger, uh, you know, sort of finger in the air, um, a number of plucked from nowhere. Uh, but whether, whether it was for plucked from nowhere or it was calculated, that there is a need for investment. Two things that were said just from previous speakers, which I just want to land on. Mm -hmm. One is the importance of looking at the outcomes. So I do agree entirely that this is not about just saying we're looking for numbers. Um, and secondly, that this is about development, uh, which creates opportunities. Now, we've spoken, we've heard a lot from sovereigns, and that's the way COP works, that's where the UN system works and the international organizations. But something has to change, it's beginning to, but we have a ways to go. And that is a recognition of the role of cities. Fundamentally, the work that needs to be done in mitigation and adaptation set by national government policies 
yes, um, worked on in collaboration with national governments still needs to be delivered at community level, still needs to be delivered with people. Uh, and perhaps one of the things that we've got to be very, very clear about, particularly on our continent, is that space being given for cities, which is sometimes closed in terms of accessing the finance, but also in terms of political engagement. So cities are for you, but then I take it back to Josephine. And of course, when you and I caught up, you said, Manus, we need to focus very clearly. We can talk a great deal about the technology that helps us on this transition, and that's laudable and applaudable, but you say it is about the natural capital assets. Expand your vision of what natural capital assets are and why they are so critical to this, this journey. Um, yeah, and I'll tie that back to something Ahmed said about, you know, getting access to the financing. So there's challenges, even when you have structured very good um, opportunities, often the criteria by which we are measured to access the financing, whether it's credit or risk ratings, are very sort of developed economy driven. So you can have challenges getting access to that financing. And once you do get access, what I'm seeing in the sort of companies and projects I'm involved in is there's a heavy focus on renewable energy, which is important. We need to transition um, effectively to different energy sources. We need strong technology. We need battery storage technology. But something that's sort of been a personal journey for me as well is the other side, which is natural capital assets. It's land, it's farming, it's biodiversity, it's regenerative agriculture. And finding ways to ensure investment goes into that part of the narrative, which is addressing our net zero carbon goals, but also our biodiversity net gain, which is just as critical. And so I feel that you know, on this concept of opportunity, let's see the opportunity not just in renewable energy, but also in these natural nature-based solutions in ensuring we address this issue. And is that about building, I mean, can I just ask you in terms of the lending and the lending practices and perhaps building on those of what you've traditionally done? That's what came out from the last panel, which is we're looking at the same problem, the old problem, but we need to progress our thinking in, in how we deal with it. That came from the Danish minister and from Rania al as, as for fundamentally as a banker, um, what, what do you need to change? What way do you, I'm not telling you to change, but um, I get the sense that a lot of other people probably are asking the bankers to change their thinking. Your response? Yeah, I mean, so as you know, we're getting calls. Um, our institutions are being called laggards by all sorts of powerful people. And um, I think that uh, that's a reflection of uh, the pace and scale of the challenge ahead of us. And people look around and they say, well, where are the intermediaries that can support um, capital in developing countries? And I think the development banks are uniquely positioned there. Um, but I think we, the next order question is, like, what are our unique assets? Um, and, and balance sheet is, is one, and I want to come in a moment to how we use it. But when we have that conversation, we sometimes forget that actually our most powerful asset as development finance institutions is the, the knowledge and relationships we have on the ground. You know, I have 50 people who work for me in Jakarta. We've been working on the Indonesian energy sector for 50 years. So that relationship set, which until now at the World Bank, at the ADB, at the African Development Bank, has largely been inward looking and been used for our own projects, actually needs to start to get aligned with the large ecosystem of private sector actors, philanthropies who are interested in our agenda. And I think even before we get to the point of what more we can do in terms of risk capital, yeah. there's enormous opportunity in, 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 in high impact partnership. And so at ADB, just in the last two months, uh, we announced a climate innovation fund funded by Bloomberg and Goldman Sachs. We announced a new sustainable finance infrastructure platform funded by Tomasic and by HSBC. And we, have, we announced a blended finance platform to acquire and early retire coal-fired power assets. In all of those cases, actually it's zero dollars from ADB in terms of balance sheet capital. Everybody needs our relationships to get things done. And so I think there's enormous opportunity from impact by leveraging this unique asset that sits inside the development finance institutions that's largely been used for our own purposes. So that, that would be point one. Point two on the balance sheet side, um, there's a lot of people who say, um, you know, you underwrite risk wrong. You need to actually um, de-risk the private sector. Um, I think that's a fair point and we should think it through, but I'd make a slightly different point, mm -hmm. which is that 
what's stopping us from doing more infrastructure investment in emerging markets and frontier markets is actually not the lack of capital. Um, it's not the binding constraint. We're on the biggest risk on uh, environment for EM that's been seen in a long, long time. We're 15 years into quantitative easing. Like cost of capital is not the issue in the world, right? The issue in these environments tends to be skills. People don't know how to develop pipeline. Um, it tends to be uh, political economy. But I think the most important thing is the thing that you were talking about. When you were talking about, you know, I have investment opportunities in my country, but you know, a private equity fund with 10-year money shows up, and that's just not the structure here. We've got scale capital globally that's designed around a series of corporate and tax considerations in developed markets. It's not fit for purpose yeah. in emerging markets. And I think one of the things that institutions like ours can do is actually try to make sure that you know, there's all this money, but it's not flowing where it needs to go, in large part, in part, because the market vehicles are not designed for the right purpose. If you want to do an infrastructure project in an emerging market country, and you want to do it from first idea to shovel in the ground, that's 10 years. Who's going to do that? Not a large you know, developed country corporate and not an infrastructure fund. And there's all these examples of these crevices, which are very large, and the money's flushing around, but it's not getting there because there's these market structure mismatches. Okay, Yvonne, you're nodding, and, and uh, of course, Dr. Uziel, um, you have a, a big ambition. So let's just get a couple of responses to, to what you've just said, uh, Ahmed, in, in terms of um, the gap. It's a gap between perhaps uh, the capital uh, and, and deploying on the ground. Yvonne, you've just listened to Ahmed talk about that gap. In other words, it's credibility, how things are presented, how they're put forward to the development banks, et cetera. Um, you're nodding, but what are you agreeing with, or, or what is it that you concur with in that narrative from Ahmed? That mismatch um, in terms of the, the structure of the financing and the, the, the ability to access it because of the returns, because of the time frames that um, you know, the private sector infrastructure funds are looking for. So um, let me use an example of, of our transport um, a bit ambition. So, so in Transform Freetown, our foundation is climate. Across 11 sectors, we have 19 targets. We're looking at a climate action plan which focuses on sanitation, transportation, also brings in um, nature-based solutions. We're planting a million trees. Transportation, 33% of our very minute greenhouse gas emissions come from transportation. We have a proliferation of low um, capacity, high emitting, very old vehicles because of government policy. Coming to that point again, a policy which encourages um, the importation of old vehicles because taxation is lower for old vehicles. As a city, this is a government policy. As a city, we have spent two and a half years, and we actually don't have your typical problem of low skills base. We actually have a really strong project team mm -hmm. and have put together an excellent proposal for a cable car. Um, a cable car system. We've worked with Medellin, we've worked with um, cable car manufacturers, we've worked with other stakeholders, but accessing even feasibility. We've paid for the pre-feasibility. Full feasibility, it's taken us two years. We finally now have two applications in, one to the Green, Green Climate Fund and one to um, C40 cities because of our membership of that. But we, when we talk about speed, so Amit's point from concept to shovel in the ground 10 years, this has got to change. And for that to change, we need to see more of that, not just the blended finance, because we do have the, we do have ADV in this mix, but it's the speed of response. You know, that, that when, when we just, just oppose the urgency of climate um, innovations, climate interventions against the typical um, cycle of accessing development funding. The two do not mix, the two do not align because we are talking about a climate emergency. No one's saying shortcut um, and don't get, do it right. Don't ensure you've got the viability. Don't ensure you've got your numbers correct. Mm -hmm. But we cannot continue to work at this pace, nor can we continue um, to have the structures that are expecting private sector money to come in. And where the, in, in, where the um, into, in the institutions are coming in, they need to move more fast, more quickly. Dr. Uziel, you, you, you gave a figure to the audience, we need $11 billion, you have projects ready. Um, when you listen to Yvonne saying the system has got to change, what is the biggest mm. and most 
substantial obstacle for you as the finance minister of Rwanda to funding this transition? Are you suffering from, I mean, Yvonne runs free time in Sierra Leone, you're the finance minister of Rwanda, so scale up the, the challenge for the audience in terms of what is the toughest part for you? I think the first step is to have the, the plans in place, which are costed, which, which give indication on the priority of the country. Number two is to have a pipeline of projects. And this is where many countries uh, have problems. The capacity to develop projects that an investor can come and say, oh, I'm interested. So if we have a pipeline project, at least a pre-feasibility studies. Then but it's also about the integrity of those projects yes, and the credibility of those projects. Which one are profitable, it can attract private sector. Which ones can, could attract private sector, but upon uh, providing some uh, de-risking instruments, this is the, so the issue that was raised. And uh, I think that uh, the committed funds for climate change, some of them could be used to uh, to de-risk some, uh, some uh, investment so that private can comfortably invest in some of the solutions, such as infrastructure, urban mobility, uh, and the others. And de-risking a lot of these projects is one thing that came through in, in, the, pre in the previous panel. Where are you on green bonds? Are, are you going to issue green bonds in Rwanda? So we... We have just started the preparation. We have never uh, issued a, a, a green bond, but our uh, development bank is already uh, in early stage of preparation for the issuance of our first uh, green bond. They get it. We hope to be successful. Okay, a any timing on that? Next year, 2022? Probably. Probably. Uh, but Ahmed, let's bring it to you. I mean, green bonds, I mean, a lot of people write headlines and news articles as these are the, you know, the, the Damascene moment for financing. Um, are they? Are green bonds a, a, a key component part of this journey, of this progress for finance? I mean, they have the potential to be, but the other bonds better not be getting a little more gray at the same time, <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, we've got to make sure that when we measure things, that we measure them at the, at the level that is relevant. Um, and if we're not measuring them at the level that's relevant, we're just relabeling things. Uh, and so I think the big challenge for the Green Mar Mar, which is a, which is a good movement, an important movement, um, is the integrity of the certification process. And if your underlying um, revenue stream or business is unchanged, it's just almost like tranching securities, right? You created a AAA tranche, but then you know, the bottom of the capital stack got riskier. Well, the same thing can happen in sustainability. And so the important thing is to make sure that that's not happening. If, if it's not happening, then it's a great movement. And Yvonne, in terms of, we, we've debated on the previous panel and on this panel uh, about the size of the funding gap, we've already established that you know it was a, perhaps an arbitrary number. Give me a sense of what you see as the funding gap, um, and how does that get how does that get closed, or how does that best get closed in your opinion? Was that to Yvonne or myself? That sorry, that was to, my apologies. I'm, I'm I'm saying Yvonne. I'm looking at Josephine. <laughs> yeah. My apologies, Josephine. Um, excuse me. Look. Apologies, Yvonne. You know, it, it may be an arbitrary number, but it's a number that people do band about. Um, and one of the, I think, opportunities we have is to better qualify what is funding actually going to these, whether you call it climate change initiatives, mm -hmm. or what is, what, is, what is the criteria by which we define that? Because that varies. Is it government pledges? Is it grants? Is it loans? Is it private sector loans? Is it public sector loans? Depending on which report you read, that number can vary, which then has the knock-on effect of making it difficult to verify and measure where it's actually had impact. So I think if we improve the system of at least defining what categorizes you know, funding that's committed to developing and emerging economies to support them in this journey, which we all need to be in collectively, and then finding more consistent ways of measuring that and bringing data around the impact and ways to show progress, I think we're making steps in the right change. And that will require private sector, public sector, governments, banks actually coming together and having consistent ways of looking at this. I mean, 
the ongoing joke on what does net zero mean. Can't, you know, there's all these phrases we use in this sector where when you actually get into the detail, we're not necessarily talking about the same things. So I think whatever the number is, the process and the steps by which we validate that money has gone to initiatives addressing the issues of net zero or biodiversity gain, allowing us to measure that and have a consistent way of progressing is going to be key. Because right now, um, I see a lot of, so depending on which report you, you read, it's going quite well or it's, you know, nothing has been spent at all. So we, we need to find some consistency. And Yvonne, if I bring it to you, which is that, that data, in other words, show and tell, isn't it? In other words, I've got this project, here's the data, it's robust, it has integrity. Um, and that's critically important in terms of convincing the banker or the financer, whether it's, whether it's state or, or, or development bank, it's the integrity of the data that you present, isn't it? Yes, but um, I think there's also um, a piece that I want to bring, bring back. When I, I listen to all the speakers, and understandably, very little is said about cities um, and cities being able to access financing. Um, I'm not sure if the ADB in Asia is different, but certainly the ADB in Africa, you work through the central, you work through governments. Um, and that's true of many other institutions. This is this could potentially, and in fact, is already a, a an additional step, an additional hurdle. And when we talk about the need for time, um, time being of the essence, it's one we really want to begin to address. If you've got that, we've got to look at the structure of our financing institutions, the finance framework. C40 cities alone account for 700 million people. Um, and by 2050, it's estimated that 70% of the population of the world will be living in cities. Can I just put to the floor, why, how is it that we are looking at access to finance for cities? So and I'll come back to your question, Manas. Um, the challenges that we're facing uh, and, and being able to, to access this funding from the perspective of a, an emerging market is, is a, it's, a, it's one which is integral to now the survival of people. Uh, um, in everything that we've discussed, we've really looked at, talked about the gap, but I want to just draw it back for a second, not just to cities, mm -hmm. but to people. I want to just remind us that there's, we've got a situation now where climate impacts, the, the weather, the changes to the, the flooding, the landslides, there is an urgency which requires matched funding. That's not coming through. Um, and it's not just about that number. It's also about the structure of financing. And it's also about policy. So for, if I could just quickly land on yes. this. Um, we have a situation where we, uh, in the previous panel, it was acknowledged, we've all acknowledged, that there's no one really holding governments to account. There's no system to say you must. But beyond that, where policies are made or policies are not made, um, which, which are going against the climate ambition, and you have cities trying to move in the opposite direction, who is being the sheriff here? Where, where are we seeing that support to ensure that agendas within at the subnational level are given the opportunity to emerge in order for climate ambition to be supported. Um, that's something which we're not talking about enough, and I wouldn't be doing my job properly if I didn't bring that to this discussion. Well, certainly the last panel um, came up with, uh, well, touched on that, which is, you know, the United Nations, they don't have the teeth to sanction in regards to climate. So let's just expand on that a little bit. Um, Josephine, uh, how, how can we, I suppose, assess that everybody's doing their part on banking, on government, on multilateral, uh, on development agencies, etc.? What would you like to see, let's say, over the next couple of years in terms of better governance, of commitments? I think the Danish minister said to me, Manus, don't worry, there's plenty of people out there who will name and shame people that are not meeting their commitments. But give me your thoughts. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent question. It's an excellent point raised by, by Mayor Ekisoya. Um, but, you know, my experience has been that the practicalities of that, yeah. of getting all the parties around the table, and all the relevant, it's more the relevant parties around the table. So 
you know, we have COP26, heads of state, big policy makers, we have business, you have advocates. But to the mayor's point, when you get that down to a city level within an economy on the African continent, how do those messages trickle down to something practical? How does, how does that financing trickle down to something practical? How does that relate to local policy, local governance, local government initiatives? Um, and so, you know, my personal view, and it's why I heavily involved in the private sector, mm -hmm. um, really being a driver for some of the scale initiatives, um, because I think sometimes government does have challenges or you know, policymakers where you know, policy may not move as quickly as always liked. I think the private sector has a lot of opportunity in terms of driving this agenda, trying to package projects um, and get data around initiatives to attract financing at scale and at pace. Um, but we need all parties around the table, and I don't have the answer on how you get all those parties around the table. Um, I think it can happen at a sort of very top level uh, sort of statement policy level, but practicality on getting everyone around the table, I, I, I don't have the answer yet on that. Well, let's take it to the Minister of Finance. We'll, we'll come back to the bank in, banker in a moment, but we'll take it to the Minister of Finance because I think it's interesting, as you say, a great deal of global ambition, global commitment, and you know, significant movement with the US and with China, etc. cetera. Um, for a Minister of Finance, you've heard a lot of the rhetoric what do you need to see happen now in the next two to three years, even on the road to Sharm el What do you want to see actually happen that would make progress on equality and climate for Rwanda? Uh, I think we have the foundations in place. We have uh, our national uh, green fund, which uh, has been operational since 2013. Mm -hmm. and we have mobilized over $200 million for green investments in the, in the form of we try through uh, our development, development bank, through grants to innovations, and uh, also uh, to other uh, uh, investment in uh, uh, climate mitigation adaptation. So what we need to scale up its capacity to mobilize more, more resources from international funds. Number two is uh, to really to have, uh, at, at the global level, to have a, a robust monitoring evaluation mechanism that we show the progress every year. So that what does that look like? Give, just, just, just define for me just briefly, what does a robust mechanism for international assessment look like? Just help me take that off the page. Like now, COP26 has made commitments. We need to see after six months, after one year, where we are. But in, in our own countries, we need also mechanism to really to, to inform all, all players about the available opportunities. Okay. Sometimes there is a communication gap as well. Even what is available may not be used in, in, in some cases. So there are institutional framework we need to have domestically. Then also the globally we need to have mechanisms that can really monitor the progress uh, periodically to see how the commitments are being, being uh, fulfilled. Dr. Uziel, quarterly reporting is the fear that in every CEO's heart that I meet. Um, Ahmed, let, let me bring it to you. Um, I, I'm quite drawn by this whole concept of, of what have you done? What have you achieved? Um, it's not for me to arbitrate whether the UN should have sanctions, capacity over climate. What do you want to see in terms of uh, assessing progress and understanding the world that you're, de that you're deploying capital to? Yeah, so I, I'll make two comments. I mean, I think um, we already have a self-monitoring system at the national level. Countries make commitments. Yes. They get measured against it. Um, I think once you start to come down from that level, uh, there's a real risk of, um, you know, the I'm a good person problem, you know, that, that various actors, you know, have a range of intentions from outcome oriented to avoiding uh, reputational harm. Um, and therefore, what they invest in is a narrative, a narrative that says, I'm a good actor. The classic example for me is uh, a, a power company that operates coal-fired power, sells it to somebody who's going to keep operating it um, for the next 30 years and says, look at me, I'm cleaner. Well, you're cleaner, but the world isn't. And so I think that um, at that level, uh, there's a few forces that can drive a little bit greater, um, greater um, scrutiny of what's happening. One is we have a very, very active 
group of citizens around the world on these issues. And I don't think they're letting institutions and people get away with things anymore. And I think that voice is extraordinarily important, number one. And ultimately, that expresses itself through the political process. Number two, um, you know, at the end of the day, you can only seek refuge and process so much. Uh, you have to look at the person in the mirror. And individual responsibility um, on, on these sorts of questions matters. Uh, and there's no way to get around it. Um, you, can't, you can't police your way to morality. You can only police yourself to legality, right? Um, and so I do think at the individual level, every leader of a company, every person, um, they also have to take responsibility, but not for these intermediary measures of success. Not how much money, right, but for outcomes. Um, and I think that that is a force that operates not just at the procedural or legal level, but at the personal and moral level. Let's just get a couple of quick closing thoughts, Josephine, fr from you. If I meet you in Sharm El Sheikh in a year's time, what's the benchmark of progress for your world? Um, it goes back to what I said, that we see progress not on just the renewable energy technology side, but this whole concept of natural capital assets, biodiversity net gain, um, mm -hmm. what we're doing around regenerative agriculture and, and other farming methods to sequester carbon. And yeah, so I, I would love to see progress on both fronts and the conversation in step on both fronts, which I believe are equally important in this. Yvonne, I can only bring it back to you as the mayor of free time, which is I presume you want to have some good conversations with architects, builders, and, uh, and, and, and the, the people that create the infrastructure that can build the cities that can help you. Who do you want to have the most conversations with in the next year, uh, Yvonne? Actually, I'm actually more interested in policy. Um, we have a situation, Joseph just talked about uh, um, nature-based solutions. We're planting a million trees, um, but at the same time, land use planning and building permits uh, those powers are not devolved to the local government as they should be, as the Act provides. They're held by the central government. So we, we, we work at a risk that investments in um, biodiversity, in green solutions, and in green jobs could be reversed by the issuing of land for construction. So I think this piece around the diverse political economies um, that exist on our continent is one that needs to be looked at. We can't detract uh, um, the reality from the conversations. We can't speak in these general terms without understanding that there is always a risk or there is a significant risk that policy narrative is not matched by actions on the ground. So that would be my biggest concern for us to really look hard at how we are measuring that success, but not just at that high level, coming down to the okay. national and ensuring that we have a co coalition of the willing that are supported. I get, I get the sense that, that, that your, your ministers of government fear the, fear the mayor of free time <laughs> when, when she strides into government buildings with a, with a new agenda. Uh, we wish you well uh, with the current crisis that you're handling. Yvonne Aki Sawyer, the mayor of free time in Sierra Leone, and my panelists here. Uh, and everybody enjoy the rest of the new economy forum. I think it's a good conversation, benchmarks and responsibility. Ahmed Saeed, vice president for East Asia, South Asia, and Pacific at the Asia Development Bank. Uh, Josephine uh, Wapa Kabula, uh, CEO of uh, Downforce Technologies, and Dr. Uziel, Minister of Finance for Economic and Planning in Rwanda. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your time at the New Economy Forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.